into our session. So what we're going to do now is we're going to finish up this study that we've been doing. Um, I've done the first couple. It's been a couple weeks, but we're going to wrap up um, this series that is simply called Of Three Ways That We Advance in the Kingdom. And so we're going to talk about how we advance, and specifically as you guys are standing for your family, as you guys are standing and you're believing for God to absolutely bring a radical transformation, a radical a miracle for your family, what does that look like? How do we do it? And so we're going to finish this thing off, and we're going to kind of go over the first two again tonight, uh, but we're really going to jump into the third one here, and that is probably the most difficult one, is this one here that we are about to discuss, the one that we are about uh, to go over. This one's probably the toughest one of, of the final third one, which is the stand, which is just standing firm. And so we're going to jump right into it here. And so we started off here talking about uh, the scripture that we see in Ephesians chapter 6, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, and it says, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spirit of forces of evil that are in the heavenly realms. And so as you guys are standing for your spouse, as you're standing for marriage reconciliation, I want you to know, just remind you, this is a spiritual war. This is a spiritual battle that is happening in the heavenly realms. And so it's so important that as we're walking, you're saying, what do I do? How do I fight this? How do I go about this? It starts to understand this is a spiritual war. This is a battle that you and I must understand we're engaging in. And so knowing that aspect, after kind of understanding that, that what we're doing, we're not fighting our spouse, we're not fighting even the situation, we are fighting different warfare. We are fighting different aspects of war. And so how do we do that? How do we stand in that aspect? And so what we're going to do tonight is go over the first two, just in a recap, just real briefly, but then really go in and talk about the last one. And so here's what with the word. This is found in the book of Ephesians. The three ways we advance in the kingdom is this. We sit, we walk, and we stand. There are times that all we can do is just sit. It's just be still. And there's times that we walk, we advance, we take ground. We actually engage in warfare. And then there's times that we simply, we're just going to stand. And that's what we're going to go and spend most of our time uh, tonight on. And so what I want you guys to be aware of is this incredible reality. Here's the verse that we talked about uh, last week when we talked about, kind of here's the overview of what does sitting look like? And so I encourage you to go back. We spent a whole hour talking on that. But what is, when you're, when you're in the sitting season, and so it's really important to remind yourself and to know that you are in different seasons in different times. God is trying to do something and teach you something about who he is, about who you are in the different aspects of those moments. So you, some of you on this who are watching this round, you're in the sitting season. The God is calling you to sit, okay? And when he's calling you into that, this is what he's calling you into. When you are in the sitting season, when you find yourself just to sit, God is trying to teach you and he wants you to learn. When we sit, we learn our identity. He is wanting you to know your identity in Christ, that you are a son, you are a daughter. We learn what was done for us. It's in those sitting seasons that we take the position of a child learning who our father is. And this is when we learn the power of rest. This is the season when he's just telling us to sit, him saying, daughter, I've got this. I don't want you to wage war. I want you to rest and I want you to know who you are because you are a child and I am your father and I am going to fight for you. It is in these sitting seasons that we just want to lay down all of our weapons of warfare and we just sit back for a moment and we just rest in the presence of the Lord and we get the energy that we find from his presence. It's in those moments that we understand that it is through the sitting season is when we just simply are being still and watching God fight for us. That is one of the most powerful seasons that we can walk in is when understanding God is fighting for us for me. And so that is what we're talking about on the sitting season. God is fighting for you. It's just here when you sit, God is the one doing all the things that needs to be done, and he wants you to rest and learn your identity. 
But then the second thing that he has you doing is after we move kind of out of that season, then the next thing is that we really just lurk. Well, let me just read you the verse here. Let me tell you the verse that's on this that we, we kind of we nailed in about this passage. It says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4, it says, But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love for us, is, is, it's because we are seated in him. It says we're, it's because of his rich love. Even when we were dead in our trans, trespasses, made a, alive together in Christ, he grace, he was, we have been saved and right here, raised us up and seated us in the heavenly realm. It is in these moments that we are seated in the heavenly realm. God just wants you to know this is your identity. You're my child. You don't have to fight for this. I will do this. I will sit and I will do all, you sit, and I will move mightily on your behalf. And that is what happens when we're in the sitting season. And so I encourage you to go back and watch that video. And the second season, the second part, this is all found in, in Ephesians chapter 6 of how do we wage warfare. This is found, found in all the book of Ephesians. We sit, we walk, we stand. And so here is the uh, walking season. This is what we learned when we talked about that, is when we walk, we learn our authority. So first one, when you're sitting, God's trying to tell you something very specific. He wants you to know your identity. Each season, each stand, each way we advance, there's a different goal that's at mind. Sitting is he wants to teach us our identity. When we're in the walking season, we learn that we have authority. God is trying to tell us, you have the power, you have the authority. It's there as we understand that some areas of breakthrough must be won. There must be warfare. Christian life does include warfare. And we learn the power that you and I possess. It's in this season when God is telling us to advance. It is in this season that we do wage the good warfare. It is the season that he tells us to walk in a worthy manner of the calling we have. That we walk, we advance, we pray, we declare, we fast, we, do, we bind, we wave our banners, we worship. We do everything that we know to do in the walking season because that is a season that we're engaged in warfare. And it's in this season, God is wanting you to know, he's wanting me to know, the authority that I have, that I am a man of authority, that I can shift nations, that my prayers are changing things, that I can go into a moment and atmosphere shift. Why? Because I have the authority of Christ, because the power of the resurrection is living in me. And when I declare, life comes, and it's in this time that we're walking, we're advancing. This is the warfare that most of us are aware of. This is the, this is the waging war. This is, the, this is why I believe so mightily in prophetic words. This is why I love to train people in prophecy, and I love in our groups that I prophesy and bring prophets among us that we can prophesy over you, because as in this season, we fight the good fight with the prophetic word, that we grab it, and we say, this is the word of the Lord. This is what he says, and we begin to declare it, and we do all the things that we do, and this is in the walking season. It is in this season that we move forward, and we do those things, and so it is in this season we do that. And so what we're going to go now, so that is the, the sitting season, okay? That's the sitting season. First, we learn our identity. We have the walking season. We learn our authority. And now we are going to talk about the standing season. It is when you are just, the third final key one is when you are just simply standing. When that is all that you have. That is all that is going on. And that is when you just simply stand. We just sit, we, we've, we've sat, we've walked, and now we're moving forward. And now we are trying to understand what does it look like to simply stand. And so this is the season that we're going to talk about right now. So I'm going to pull up here on the screen. Um, that, that there are things that we do when we're just in this, when, of how do we stand? What are those moments? that What is going on in this standing season? Because the reality is this. I want you to look at this on the screen here. Here's the reality. When we stand, this is when we learn our endurability. You're like, Jason, endurability, what the word are you talking about? This is when we learn the ability, the gift and how we have the absolute power to endure. This is a major component in the Christian life, to endure, to persevere, to stand up bravely under. We must, number one, in the sitting season, understand our identity, that we're children of God. We have to do nothing for that. 
We must understand the walking season, the authority we have. We have our identity. We have our authority. But now we also must learn that we have endurability, that there is times that we just stand firm and we simply not give up and we endure. It is here where I'm going to teach you tonight that we must relearn this lost art of endurance. This is a difficult one. This one's tough. And also understanding that God is wanting to shift our perspective of how we see trials, how we see tests. It is in these moments right here. It is in the standing season. It is when we are standing that we understand, hey, I can endure. I can persevere. I can make it through this journey. I can make it through the long haul that I, I am not giving up. I am not bound by all this, 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 this uh, weakness that I have the power to Christ to stand firm. And so I'm going to read you these passages here. I love these scriptures. I'm going to read them to you tonight in the, I'm going to read you a bunch of verses. So if you have your notes, I want you to write a bunch of scriptures. I have all these notes. If you want the scriptures, I'm more than happy to give them to you. But there's going to be a bunch on the screen because this is crucial that we learn how do we stand and the importance of standing. This is the one we don't want to talk about. We want to talk about resting in God and let him win the victory. Absolutely. We want God to fight for us, and we want to learn what that looks like, and we want to watch him fight and watch him win. We want to be just cheering on the power of God. I'm with you. There's times that we want to take it and God's telling us to charge and we have victory and we are moving forward and we're pushing the enemy back and we're shoving all the forces of darkness and we're having an advancing time. But it's this last one. When we are just simply called to stand and do nothing except I'm not going backwards. This is the one we don't talk about a lot. And if I can be honest, for you who are standing for your marriage, I say this is the one you probably need the most. This is the one, the standing season that we need to say, God, equip me to stand. Equip me to not give in. Equip me to not lose hope. And so I want you to look at these verses here that I'm going to put on the screen. Like I said, I'm reading the uh, New amp, the Amplified Version, and the Amplified Version of the Bible, it is just the translation of the Bible that the scholars took the Greek word. My, my minor was in biblical languages, so I had a, a minor. I took several years of Greek and Hebrew, so my minor in college was biblical languages. And what this Amplified Version does, it takes the original language, and it tries to explain and amplify the original meaning of it. Just the English to Greek, the translation, the, you're using so many more words in the English than we have in the Greek. So if you want a pure, literal translation from Greek to English, it's going to be huge, okay? And so the Amplifiers did their best to try to take the main principles that were found in the Greek, and it wrote it out. So an Amplified version is much bigger. The, the, it's much thicker. The verses are much longer. So look at this verse here on the Amplified version. It says this. This is the armor of God. This is where we're going to get the stand from. Put on God's whole armor, the armor of a heavy armed soldier, which God supplies, that you may be able to successfully stand up against all the strategies and the deceits of the enemy. And then look at verse, verse 3, verse 13, excuse me. Therefore, put on God's armor, that you may be able to resist and stand your ground on the evil day of danger. And having done all that the crisis demands to stand, stand firmly in your place. And then it says it again, stand therefore and hold your ground, having tightened the belt of truth. And it gets, then it begins to right now on the passage go into what we know as the armor of God. But here in Ephesians chapter six, Paul is writing and he says, right before he gives you the armor, he says, after you've done everything to do to stand, stand firm. After you've done everything to stand, stand. Are you needing the help to stand? Stand. So what is he saying here? He has given you this image that, man, I am doing everything in the war. I am standing firm. I am over here, and I'm not budging, and I feel all the weight of hell coming against me. I feel all the enemy forces attacking me, that they are coming at me with everything they've got, and what he is telling us to do in this season. This is not a season. If you're in this standing season, and most of you are, so we need to learn this, that is in this season when there might be a moment 
moment that all you are called to do is stand firm, is not give up, is not lose ground, that this is not a season that you can simply just kind of rest and watch, the, watch God move in power. It will happen. So I want you to know, there's not always black and white, so please don't hear me, but understand there's, these are different mindsets and seasons we walk in. But this is a time that we are not advancing, that when you're in the standing season, you might not be pushing back the enemy right now. In this very moment, this very, this very day, this very hour of warfare, you might not be making ground, but what you're doing is you're not losing ground. So there's times in this stand that you just tell the devil, I'm not going back. I'm not losing the ground that we have taken up to this point. It's not going to happen. That we just learn the ability. We learn the supernatural ability just to stand firm, to not give up. We need to learn. We have to learn and relearn this ability, this availability to be able just to endure and to not give up up. Hebrews chapter 6, verses 11 through 15. I want you to listen to these verses. Hebrews 6, verse 11 through 15. It says this, and we desire that each one of you show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope until the end. Guys, just declare, I'm going to show the hope until the end. That you do not become sluggish, but you imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promise. Verse 13, for when God made a promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself saying, surely blessings, I will surely blessing, I will bless you and multiply and I will multiply you. And verse 15, and so after he had, look at this, patiently endured, he attained the promise. Guys, what is so hard about this one right here? is that I would, this is one I did not want to embrace in my stand. I was believing, and I had my mind completely set that the miracle's gonna happen today. And guys, you need to have that mindset. You need to have that hopeful expectation that today's the day. You gotta have the hope. You gotta have walking forward saying, today's the day my spouse is returning. Today's the day. But you also need to have the ability to stand firm like Abraham. We stand in an understanding that no matter what happens, no matter how long it takes, I'm not giving in. I want you to keep looking at these verses here. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 4. This is verses 8 and 9. For we are hard pressed on every side, but we're not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but we are not destroyed. I want you to say that over yourself. Say, look, I am standing firm in this reality that, yes, I am am pressed in on every side. I might be crushed. I might be perplexed. I am being persecuted, but I'm not abandoning. I am standing firm. I might be getting struck down, but I am not destroyed. It is in this aspect of how we advance. There's moments and seasons that you just have to get the still iron in your back and say, I am not budging. I am not done. Look how the, uh, the passion translation, uh, reads this verse, same verse, second Corinthians four, eight through nine. This is the passion translation. It says, though we experience every kind of pressure, we're not crushed at times. We don't know what to do, but quitting is not an option. How could I define this third aspect of the stand is this verse quitting is not an option. You just say, I'm going to stand firm. I'm going to take the devil's best blows. I'm going to take everything he's got, but I am not stand. I'm not going to quit. I will stand firm. And he keeps going. Quitting is not an option. Okay. I want you to type that, declare that quitting is not an option. When you get this part of the stand, when we, we, we sit and we let God fight for us, we just rest in his presence and we just allow him to move. And we're getting refreshed. Like we're away from the front lines, but we're kind of back in the tent and we're just getting kind of re-energized to go back forward. There's times that's the sitting season. Then there's the walking season, sit, walk, stand. We walk, we advance, we wage war, we push the devil back. We make victory. We make declarations. We do all 
the things that we're called to do, and we do take ground. We absolutely, we kick the devil's door down. That's in the advancing, the advancing stage, the walking stage. But my friends, there is a standing stage that we understand when everything comes at you, there are moments that you have it set in your heart, in your mind, that I am just going to stand firm no matter what. Quitting is not an option. It says, we're persecuted by others, but God, he's not forsaken us. We may be knocked down, but we're not out. It's in this season that you begin to declare, I may be knocked down, but I am not out. It's we're standing firm. We're knocked down, but we are not out. Look what Galatians chapter 6, verse 9 says. Let us not become weary doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we don't give up. I want to tell you, friends, it is okay for you to be so weary and so beat down by what you're going through to feel those emotions. I want you to know you have permission to feel those emotions. But but God knew that, and that's why he said, let us not become weary in doing good because it can happen. But he says, for at a proper time, he reminds us we will reap a harvest if we don't give up. The devil wants you to quit. He wants you to give up. That's what he's trying to do. He wants you to stop. You and I, in the standing seasons, we declare we will not stop. We will reap a harvest because we will not give up. The message translations of Psalms uh, chapter 31, verse 24 says, be brave, be strong, don't give up. Expect God to get here soon. This is the standing season. When you're reminding yourself of scriptures, when you're just standing firm, you are okay of not having victories. And I'm telling you, I know that's hard. If you're like me, okay, I, I, I'm an athlete. I teach tennis professionally. Okay, I've traveled all over the world. I want to win. And it is hard to understand that I'm not making progress. This was such a hard lesson, a such a hard season for me to embrace that there are moments that I have to be okay of not winning the moment or winning the day. There's moments that I need to say, I'm going to just live and fight for another day. I am just going to take my licks, but I'm not going to stop. I will still be around, and I'm not giving in. 2 Corinthians Verse 12, verse 9, gives us such hope in this season. He says, my grace, you know, it's sufficient for you. Why? Because my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weakness. So the power of Christ rests on me. This is the declaration we make in those standing seasons, that we say, you know what, I am weak, but I ain't going nowhere. I'm hurt, I'm crying, but I ain't stopping. Because it's in this standing season, when the pain is real, when the, the blows are real, when the words that are spoken hurt, when, the, when those papers come in the mail, it absolutely just throws you around. When the spouse is cutting off all contact, the thoughts, the, it's, it's horrible. I understand. But it's here when we just say, I'm not, I'm not budging. And I will boast that I'm weak right now because I know this absolute fact in the standing season that my weakness is just an invitation for the power. Let me reword that. For the perfect power of God to invade my life. And so that is when... Now we move into of this standing season. It's in this moment, it's here in the standing season that we do understand this is a moment of trials. This is the moment of testing. And this is the moments most of us run from. We don't embrace this season of our life. That when if we feel like we're, we're resting in God, when we feel like we're having peace and everything's good and God's showing up and, and, and everything is hunky-dory and, man, you're having the most incredible times of, of worship and refreshing comes from the Lord and you're seeing God do victories on your life and you see him fighting for you and you're resting and you're saying, God, you're amazing, you're incredible. Oh, that's beautiful. 
There's seasons that you're advancing, you're taking ground. Man, you're marching and moving forward. Those are beautiful. But it's this season, my friend, that we have to understand is also part of the process. There's season of trials. There's season of testing that most of us run from. But I'm begging you, don't. Just stand firm. And I want to talk real briefly now as I kind of turn this talk, as we kind of, kind of do a, a kind of a, we're heading back home here. But I want to talk about trials and, to, and test that, that we endure in the standing season. It's this verse right here that we see in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9. You know, that he says, my grace is sufficient for you. We remind ourselves, his power is perfected in our weakness. But we need to know that. Why? Because I want to look at this next verse, James 1. The passage that we don't like to hear, that we don't want to talk about, the one that we just so hope is in our situation, but we're missing out if we don't talk about it. James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4, it says this, Brethren, I count it all joy when you fall into various trials. And isn't that, feel, isn't that true? Don't you love how they worded it? When you fall into it. Most of you are like, man, I fell in this thing. I wasn't choosing. I just fell into a pit. I fell into this trial. He says, but even in that moment, count it joy. Let the joy come. Why? Because it says, knowing that your testing of your faith produces patience. So now he's saying it's this trial. There's a purpose of this. In this standing season, I am trying to show you something right now in this season of hell. I want you to know I've got a plan that I'm working something out and I will use this and I have to use this. And my dear friend, you've got to go through this because this is what I'm going to do to craft something beautiful in your family. And he says that because the testing of your faith produces patience, but let patience have its perfect work. And I know that is like, oh my gosh, that's such a horrible word, patience. But he's begging you. It's like God is just saying out to you, please let patience have its perfect work. Why? That you may be perfect, complete, lacking nothing. He is saying to us in the standing season that yes, this is a trial, this is a test. But here he's saying, do not stop. Let it work. Let it do what it's all wanting to do. And here's the definition of patience that I found in this expositional study of the New Testament of words. So the patience in this passage, re- look at this. Definition of patience is the independent, unyielding, defiant perseverance in the face of aggressive misfortune and thus to a kind of courageousness. Man, doesn't that describe you? You understand that? Can you relate to that definition? Man, this is what God is trying to give you. This is what he's wanting you to walk in. I'm going to read it again. The independent, unyielding, defiant perseverance. I want you to just declare that I will be defiantly perseverance of the restoration of my family because I am in the face of aggressive misfortune. And thus, this is what's going to happen. I will produce a kind of courageousness. This is what's happening. This is what God wants to create in you in the standing season. We're like, I'm just standing firm. I'm in the middle of this trial. I'm in the middle of this test. And he's like, let this patience work in you. Let me use this moment to build something up in you that you've never encountered before. When I went through my situation with my family and we separated, God spoke so clearly to me. And he says, Jason, what I want to do in your life is yes and amen. The plans I have for you, the ministry visions you've had for your future, they are all yes, I will do that. But I am not going to waste this moment you're in because I want to teach you something that you'll never learn any other way. He said, I had to bring some stuff out. I have to work on some stuff. And he's saying to us, please, let it happen. Let it go. Let it continue. And then he just keeps going here. Uh, He gives us this incredible promise. Oh, I love this promise. This is huge. Look what this says here, 2 Peter 1.3. This is one of my favorite verses in all the scripture. Write this down, 2 Peter 1.3. You need to know this verse as you stand. If you're in a standing season, which I'm sure you all are, you need this verse. And this promise is what it says. His divine power, who? God. God's divine power has given you everything that you need for life and godliness. Let me read that again. 
God's divine power has given you right now. It doesn't say will give you, doesn't say might give you, doesn't say, you know what, it gave you a long time ago, but now it's not there. No, this is a present tense verb. He has, he is, he's continually, you have the power. He's given it to you for a godly life. I have the power. When I was a kid, I'm dating myself, but I loved He-Man. I was a big He-Man guy. I had all the little toys when I was a kid, a little He-Man, okay? And his big cry, He-Man cry was, I have the power. He used to grab the, the sword, and I don't know if lightning came from heaven, and just this power just rushed it through him, and he would go, and he would attack Skeletor, okay? And so he knew he had the power. My dear friend, I want you to know you have the power to stand, God has already given it to you. He has already equipped you with it. You are walking in the authority of the power of God. And so he's just saying, look, when everything's coming at you, my dear friends, everything is hitting you. You're doing everything you can to stand. Guess what? Stand firm. Put that extra, just those, those cleats into the ground and just declare you're not going anywhere. And so this is the power that God wants us to walk in. This is the stand. This is the third way we advance in the kingdom is, yes, we sit and we rest and we allow God to move on by behalf and he, and he comforts us and we understand what? Our identity. He's trying to teach us our identity. Then he tells us walk and we advance. We take ground. Why? Because God is trying to show us our authority. There were not these weaklings. There were not just these little, just little bitty, just, you know, just helpless people and the devil's so powerful. He's like, no, I've given you authority. And he wants you to know you have authority. You have the power over the demonic realm. Your prayers matter. The prayer of the righteous man is powerful and effective. The scripture says that your prayers are changing things. It's it, your prayers are bringing your spouse home. Absolutely. Why? Because you have authority, but it's also important that we learn to stand. Why? So that you can be confident that I also have endurability. That I'm like that Rubbermaid commercial when a, a little car would run over it and I'd pop back up because the devil is trying to tell you, you can't make it through this. Why is this stand so important? The devil wants you to know you can't endure this. There's no way you're going to survive this. You can't take another week, much less another month. Definitely not a year. You're out of your mind. You cannot make this. And the devil's trying to tell you that. And so it's in the standing season we stand firm, that we understand that we have this endurability, the perseverance that God wants us to have. It is in this season that he's telling us that. And one of the key components to help us in this moment, we see in this verse here in Psalms 100, verse 4. We enter the gates with thanksgiving, his courts with praise. We give thanks and praise in his name. He wants us to understand that even in this standing season, even when everything's coming at us, he wants us to be full of joy. He wants us to be full of thankfulness. He wants us to be full of praise. And that is what happens in these moments. Okay, what, the, what I believe so desperately God wants to do right now is that he wants to shift our perspective of how we see trials. How do we see the test? How do we see what's going on? How do we see this? How do we in, figure out what's happening? I believe so desperately he wants to shift how we view this. He wants to shift the perspective of the situation that's going on. And so that is what he's trying to do. And it's in the standing season that we understand that, that we walk in that, that we, re that we understand the power of that. Because he says in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 6 and 7, it says, In all this, greatly rejoice, though now through a little while you have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that your faith, look at this, your standing, all hell's going around you. And he's saying, stand, don't give up. Why? So that you have proved that your faith, so that your faith, uh, greater worth than gold, which perishes even through the refined fire, it may be proved genuine and may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus is revealed. Right now, you're going through a trial. You're going through a test. 
And most of us, when we hear the word trial or test, we like, get me the heck out of this. I hate tests. There's nothing about a test I like. I didn't like tests in school, and I don't like tests now. And anytime you tell me that I'm tested by God, I say, I rebuke you in Jesus' name. God is wanting to shift our perspective of what a trial and what a test is. This is saying the test has a purpose. There is a purpose of the test. And it is to prove, it says there on the end, it is to prove that your faith, that your faith, so that your faith is proven that it is genuine, that it's there, that it's accurate, that it's, that it's absolutely on fire. Okay, I want you to look here at what this definition of a trial is. It's the act of trying, testing, or putting to the proof a tentative or experimental action in order to ascertain results. You're like, okay, Jason, what are you talking about there? What does that mean? Why, why, are, you, why are you telling me that? Okay? There's, there's a reason for that. Because it, if you don't understand, it is very hard to rejoice in trials until we can shift our perspective of the trial. The Bible says to greatly rejoice in these moments. We rejoice in the fact that our faith is being proven. So when we're standing, when we're in the standing season, it's this moment that we are called to rejoice. Why in the world would I rejoice? How in the world am I supposed to rejoice when I'm in the middle of a trial? How, how can that even take place? Because it is in the moment of trial that something is about to be revealed. Something is about to be given to you in the standing season, in this moment. You're like, what do you mean, Jason? Now I want you to think of this real quick with me. When you think of a trial or you think of a, of a test, there is a result that comes from that. Okay? So let's think of a couple trials here real quick. When is a trial a good thing? Okay? Let me tell you when a trial is a good thing. One, clinical trials. You agree. Right now we got a global pandemic. We hope there are clinical trials taking place. Why? So that they can prove that there is this drug or there is a you know something to heal the COVID-19 or there is a clinical trial that they do to prove what they have is, is, is curing cancer we want the trials we don't want just to have something just given to you and don't have no power we're like yes we embrace the clinical trial it is a good thing okay what's another trial uh, that actually is there to prove something okay one a court trial if you've ever been falsely accused of something, you want a trial. You want a judge to say, you know what? It's come to trial, and I have deemed and judged that this is wrong, that this is not true. And he dares to declare a certain truth. A trial relieves and brings forth revelation of truth. It's proving something, right? Okay. Um, another trial there is, let me think. There is a uh, time trials. If you're an athlete, there are Olympic time trials that you have to meet a certain standard, a certain level in order to go to the Olympics. So athletes look forward to the trials. They want to go to the trial. They want the time trials. They want to say, yes, I am now an Olympian. People can't become an Olympian until they pass those trials. So that it, by them passing a trial, it leads them into something else. Does that make sense? And then um, I think of a lawyer, you know, like the bar exam, okay? They cannot become a lawyer until they pass the bar, until they pass the test. They pass this this, this test that they're facing. And so someone whose desire and their great ambition in life is to be a lawyer, they, you know, they might hate the fact they're in, they're having to study for the test. They don't like they're taking this bar, but what they love is the result of the test. That the test, the bar exam, has now proven to them and to the whole world that they are qualified and ready to become a lawyer. So there are all of these examples 
of when a trial, when a test is a positive thing because it brings forth something. Once you go through the test, you have this amazing thing happening, coming you, okay? It shows that it is viable. And so most of us run away from tests. We're like, I don't want to test. I don't want my patience to be tested. Well, I'm saying, please let it be tested because once you pass the test, you're going to, sh- it's proving to the world is what the scripture says, that you are faithful, that you endure. And then you see all the angel armies backing you and moving a test, a trial is absolutely crucial. All trials, almost all trials or tests, whatever wording you want to use, there's a promotion on the end of the other end of that. Why do I want you to stand firm, not run from the trial that you're embracing? Because I want you to know there's a promotion coming on the other end. Like I said, the other end of an Olympian athlete, they passed that trial. They're now an Olympian. There's a promotion. If you're a law student, you pass the bar, you're now a lawyer. There's a promotion. Okay? If, if you are testing out cars and you're doing all you can to, to build this amazing car, well, guess what? There's crash test that it has to pass. And once you've done that, you're now able to sell the car to the world. It's now a promotion. And so I want you to have a different perspective of the trial of the testing that you're in, that God knows what's going on. He is saying, look, this has to happen because I have a promotion for you. I've got something beautiful coming your way. I have got something coming your way that's going to blow your socks off. But my dear friend, we got to go through this. We got to have you pass this test. We need you to go through this trial so it can prove all the ways that it is happening. And why is faith so important? Because it says in the scripture, it pleases God. The trial in the spiritual sense, it proves that our faith is genuine. When it talks about the context that I just read, the trial, the test, prove of your faith. And that is what pleases God. And so as we wrap up here, I want to quickly go and put on the screen for you, these are, these are, Four very specific trials, very specific tests that you see in the scriptures. And I want you to see, are any of these what you're encountering right now? Because if you're in the standing season, this is a season that maybe don't worry about making forward grounds. Maybe you don't even try to get all the rest and peace. Just right now, just don't give up. Don't lose ground. And it helps you not to give up. It helps you not to lose ground when you understand there's a purpose going on. There's something happening. There's a, there's a, there's a, uh, there's some, there's a golden pot at the end of the rainbow. It's important to know if you're in a trial, you're in a test, don't give up because there is glory on the other end of this. So as you're standing firm, you're choosing not to give up. Don't back up. Don't give the enemy one more ground. You've done all this work to get to this point. Don't give up. And so here are four biblical examples of tests that you see, of tests or trials, whatever word you want to use, of you seeing the Bible. And I'm not going to get deep into these, but I'm going to go real fast because I want to wrap up this study here, is that the first one we see is this. We see an endurance or a patience test. The endurance patient test, that can be seen no greater than the life of Abraham. When he was promised a son, he was promised that he would be the father of many nations. Now, I'm going to say something nobody wants to hear, but I just need to say it. Abraham waited 25 years. He was patient. He waited for this to happen. And I'm not prophesying, declaring you're going to wait 25 years. I'm not saying that at all, okay? But I am saying, Abraham said, I'll pass this test. I'll endure. I'll be patient. I will hang on to the promise God's given me no matter what. This is a test in the scripture. This is a biblical test. The endurance patient test is to prove and to, to God is wanting to know, okay, how, 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 pro, prove it to the world. Prove it to the devil. Let's see your faith in action. And you can, I want to encourage you. God will not enter you into any test. He doesn't expect you to win. Let me reword that. 
He's not going to enter any test that he knows he doesn't equip you to win. Why? We already read that verse a while ago about you have given, he has given you everything you need for life and godliness. So if his divine power has given you everything, he has already given you the ability to pass these tests. So I'm about to show you four of them. I don't want anyone reading these tests and say, oh, no, I can't pass it. No. Then rewind five minutes, ten minutes, and listen to me say, you have all the divine power in heaven in you to pass. He's already given it to you. The spirit of Christ that raised him from the dead is living in you. You've got this, okay? So now, look at these right quick. The endurance test of you see it in Abraham waiting and patiently waiting for the promise of his son, okay? I'm going to read this to you. Here, here's a description that I wrote about the endurance test. It says, here... You have to override your flesh and your own impatience. Hello, I'm speaking to some people, right? And simply rely on God's peace through the Holy Spirit and God's perfect timing as to when he will want to open up that door for you. If you ever find yourself facing this kind of trying test, make sure that you do not let your impatience get the better of you and cause you to walk away from that door that you are sitting in front of as that door could be opening at any time. Stay put right where God currently has you at and force yourself to wait until that door either opens up or for you to walk through it or for God to tell you something different. This is the endurance and patience test is that you say, I, I'm not moving. I'm not going. I, I'm, I'm not budging. I'm standing firm. I am waiting. However long it takes, I'm waiting. I'm not going to give up. That might be one of the tests here that you're seeing. The second test that we see in the scripture is the radical obedience test is what I call it. This also has to do with Abraham. So when we have the endurance and patience test, and here is the radical obedience test. Abraham, you're like, man, this is the craziest story ever. I mean, radical obedience. Can you think of a greater, more radical, extreme act of obedience than having to lift the knife on his son? That yes, Abraham finally passed the endurance test. He finally passed the patience test. He made it. He made it through. And he has the son. And now he's called to sacrifice the son. And he's like, what? I, I, I passed the waiting test. I passed the endurance test. What do you mean? I've got, now God is saying, thank you for waiting. And now I want to make sure that you're radically obedient. That you will obey me no matter what I say. And that was a test Abraham then faced second. He had to trust God was going to do something supernatural as he put his promise on the altar and he lifted up the knife. This is what God told me. He says, Jason, have you, he, what I felt he told me is, Jason, I feel you put your marriage on the altor. You, you, you've, you've given to me the altar of worship. But you know what? You haven't lifted the knife, which means you haven't trusted me completely, that I will be your God and, I, and you will be that I will speak and I will, I will provide a way out no matter what happens. That's a radical obedience. And I'm not trying to, I, and I know when you're, some of you are, are feel like, man, the, life's being, the knife's being lifted on me, I get it. So please hear my heart and don't take what I'm saying, this analogy, all the way to the end of saying, well, you know, is God telling me to destroy my marriage? You know what, I'm not saying that, but I am saying there was a level of radical obedience, radical obedience that Abraham did. It made no sense to him that flew in the opposite of everything, radical obedience. God told me to make some radical obedience steps when I was standing for my marriage of what to do with the lawyer, how to communicate with the lawyer, things that made no sense to me and no sense to the lawyer. And I said, no, this is what we're going to do. No, we're going to go this route. And he says, Jason, you could lose everything if you do this. And I knew I heard the Lord. I knew I heard the Lord in, in, with, with, with the lawyer. I knew I heard him. He says, if you do this, Jason, it will ruin everything. Obey me, and I will, do, I, I will do this. And I was, I just said, okay. And I gave my lawyer instructions that he says, I don't agree with this. I don't agree with this. He was like, Jason, you, we're getting everything that we wanted. You know, you, we're getting the, 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 the settlement or the, the steps that we want. If you go this route, everything could change. She might change her mind. And God said, Jason, obey me. And I did the radical obedience into that right now. And so that's what I did. And so here is the radical obedience. If you want to enter into your true calling in the Lord, then get it settled right now in your mind and in your heart.
that you will fully obey the Lord with every specific thing that he will be asking of you to do in this life. If you can agree to do things God's way rather than your own way, then you will be promoted into God's best for your life and you can then proceed to leave your mark in this world in the specific calling that he will be setting up for your life. Radical obedience. This is what's happening. This is what he's calling you into. A level of obedience that might seem strange to you, that might, might, that might make zero sense to you, this is the level of obedience he's calling you. So this is one of the trials that he has for you. Okay, as we kind of recap, these are some of the four trials here. We have the endurance test. We have the radical obedience test. And then finally, we have this, the opposition to the promise test. This might be the test that he's calling you into. So this is what he's trying to show. You might be, you might be passing the endurance test. You might be, you might be passing the uh, the, the, the patience test, and you might be going forth the radical obedience test. But what about the opposition of the promise test? You see here, I wrote down the story of Caleb and Jacob. If you don't know that story, Caleb and Jacob were sent out to scout the promised land. And they had 12 spies, and they went out. And all 12 spies went out and said, here's the promise. Go scout the promised land that we're about to walk into. So they went, and they, they camped out, and they went, and they, they went over, they looked at the promised land, and then they saw the Philistines. They saw the giants. Heck, they might have even saw Goliath. They saw all of these things, and it just they saw the obstacles that were in their way. Let me tell you, they were real obstacles. The land was full of giants. The land was full of enemies. The land was full of all kinds of dangerous things that they would have to overcome. And God said, are you going to pass this opposition of the promise test? Are you going to allow the opposition that you face of you walking into your promise? Is that going to keep you from happening? And the story goes, 10 of the, 10 of the spies Man, they were freaking out. They said, man, we're just a bunch of grasshoppers. We can't. We can't overcome them. They're scared to death. But Caleb and Joshua, they said, we got this. We can overcome because God has given us this promise. It doesn't matter what opposition is in the way. If God's given us the promise, we're going to enter the promised land. Some of you right now are struggling because you're facing opposition of your promise. If you are ever faced with this kind of a test with the Lord, you will have to make a very big decision one way or the other. You will either have to fully believe that God is calling you to go through this door and that he will then anoint you with this power to be victorious in his calling, or you will let fear and intimidation get the better of you, and you will then walk out on the call that God has set up for your life. So be confident that God has given you enough faith, anointing, and power to receive this promise. So be assured that you can take all of the opposition and the roadblocks that come on the road to your promised land. So what opposition are you facing to your promise? Are you seeing opposition? Is your spouse or people around you just giving you all and you're seeing it? They're saying this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong. I'm not talking to you, I'm not communicating to you, I'm doing this, I'm doing this. You are seeing all the opposition. And I want you to know that even though if you see the opposition, don't allow the enemy, don't allow the size of the giants to stop you from running into your promised land. That's what happened with these. Ten of them, they let the size of the giants stop them from entering in. And that is a test that they had to walk through, the opposition of the promised land test. And so finally, the final test that we're going to talk about as we wrap up here is this, number four, the temptation of sin test. This test was offered and administered to no other than Jesus. Jesus had to pass this test. Right when Jesus was said, this is my son whom I am well pleased, and the Holy Spirit came on him immediately after. Jesus walked into the wilderness for 40 days, and he says he faced temptation, and he was tempted. We know of at least three encounters, it says in Scripture, when the devil came and tempted him. But there's an understanding that he was tempted of everything there was. And Jesus had to pass this test. He had to pass the temptation of sin. Why? Because if he fell into this temptation of sin, this would hinder everything that he was about to do. 
The devil knew from the very get-go, if I could get him to sin, that I would then instantly disqualify him from walking into the promise, walking into his divine assignment, if I could just get him to sin. So I'm telling you guys, some of you right now might be facing this test, this trial. As you're standing firm, no, this might be coming at you, the temptation of sin. And I want you to know you need to be aware of that because the sin that's being tempted at you, that very sin could disqualify you from walking into your divine assignment. That's the way it was for Jesus. But he overcame that. The reason you are facing this test is to train you and to prove to you, to the world, and to the devil that you walk in the righteousness of God. You partner with Holy Spirit's power that is inside of you to stay out of any type of serious sin that would prevent you from crossing over into your true calling and your divine purpose. That is what's happening. That is why God wants you to overcome this. So if you're facing all the sin that's coming at you, I want you to know you have the great ability to overcome and and to win that test. And to prove to you and to the world and to your spouse and to the family and everyone around you saying, look, there's no sin coming on her. There's nothing stopping them. That there's nothing stopping this reunion. There's nothing coming against this right now. And so, as we conclude, here's the four specific tests that we see. There's, there's several more, I'm sure, but I want to just throw these four at you as you stand. As you stand firm, as you're choosing just to not give up, you're choosing to not lose ground, you're choosing, I will pass this trial. Are you facing the endurance or patience trial or test? If you're seeing one of these four that you know without a doubt which one you're facing, I want you just to type in your comment, say, this is the one that I'm in, and then declare, I'm going to win. I want you to name it. Know which one you're in. Don't be fooled to know how the enemy's trying to attack you or what the Lord's trying to do with you. Sometimes this is the Lord leading you through because he wants you to prove to you in the world that you've got this, that you're going to win. Is it the endurance patience test? Abraham waiting for his son. Is it the radical obedience test? Abraham having to be obedient that made no sense. Is it the opposition to the promise test? Are you facing opposition and and warfare and all the giants in the land and they're real? But can you overcome and don't worry about that? You're like, the promise is the promise. Or is it the temptation of sin test? Is sin creeping at your door? And God is wanting you to know you have the power to overcome it because he has given you the power to overcome everything there is for life and godliness. That is the promise that God has given you. That is the promise God is giving me. And that is the power that he has leading you into walk through. And so as we wrap up here, as we come into conclusion, as we finish our series on sit, walk, and stand, as we wrap it up here, the three ways that we advance in the kingdom, it's simply this. We sitting season. God's not ushering some of you in and just to sit and be still. And when that is happening, what is he doing? He is trying to teach you your identity. Maybe you're in the walking season from the last study we did. When you're walking right now, he is trying to teach you your authority. And there's also times that we just stand, and that's how we advance because in those moments, He wants to teach you your endurability. That is what he's trying to show you. These are the three ways we advance in the kingdom. Sit, we learn our identity. Walk, we learn our authority. Or stand, we learn our endurability, that we can endure, that we have the power to overcome no matter anything that is coming at us. And so now I want to just pray with you as we wrap up the study. That God will give you the power to advance in all three of these areas. What's the crazy thing about God? He's so good and he's so fun and he's so, he uses the body. So there's times that you're in the sitting season. God's telling you to rest. And your best friend is in the walking season. And you're seeing them advance and major warfare and they're, man, they're kicking the devil in his cookies. They're just doing all that he wants to do and they're taking ground. And then maybe the very next moment, you find yourself in this standing season that all of hell is coming at you and you are not meant to win a moment, but you are just meant to stand firm and just not give up and not give in. And you're trying to pass this test that he's walking you through. You're just not going backwards. So whatever three of these are in, I want to pray. You're about to encounter another one. I'm sure this is just how we advance. There's times we sit, there's times we walk, there's times we stand. 
And it just goes in and out because God is constantly wanting us to know these three things, our identity, our authority, and our absolute perseverance, our endurability. My last thing here is I love the reality is that endurance, perseverance, you know, that's a gift of the Holy Spirit. The devil doesn't have perseverance. You have perseverance. What does that tell me? That tell me when I'm standing firm, when I'm not giving up, guess what? I will outlast the devil. He will quit because he's a loser. But I will stand because I have the gift of the Holy Spirit to stand firm. He will move on to someone else. He doesn't have the gift of perseverance. That is a gift of the Holy Spirit. That is a fruit of the Holy Spirit, I should say, that you have. So, hope you enjoyed this study of three ways we advance in the kingdom. Let me pray for you now. So I pray, Lord, Holy Spirit, that you would come and you would move on every person who's watching this video right now, that you would give them the absolute confidence that they can just sit and be still and know their identity is in you, that they are a child, that they have to do nothing to win the battle, that you are daddy and you will win, that they would learn their identity in Christ. God, I pray for those right now who are in the walking season, who are taking ground because you're teaching them the authority that they have in you. God, I pray that you would empower them with the tools and the weapons and the mindsets and all the things that is needed to win the battle that they're in right now. And Lord, and I pray those who are in the standing season, who are trying to learn that they can endure anything, that there's nothing that can come against them that will make them fall or that will make them quit, that you would give them this gift of endurability right now. So, Father, I thank you for everyone watching this. I thank you for the miracles that are happening in their life and in their family's life as they advance your kingdom and what they're doing now. So I bless you. I speak hope and resurrection power and the ministry of reconciliation over every single one of you. God bless.